Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations, and welcome back to the channel for this open mic. And we're so glad that you guys are joining us here today. Here's how today's open mic is going to go. And we'll probably go this way on open mic for at least a while. We're going to try this way. So the first thing we're going to do on open mic today is answer the leftover tip questions that we didn't get around to on the John Campy show today. And then once you get through those, we'll open up the super chats and we'll take some live questions for those of you who are watching live. But once again, just so you guys know, if you want to send in a question to be read on the John Campia show or here on open mic anytime 24 seven, you don't have to be watching live to do it. Go ahead and go to our tip link at streamelements.com slash John Campia slash tip. That will get your question on either the John Campia show or here on open mic. If we deem your question appropriate to be read on the show and uh, we'll talk to you guys then. So yeah, today we're going to get through the questions that we have. Now, listen, if you've sent in a question on the tip link in the last hour or so, you may not see it read right now because it'll probably just be uh, left over for, it'll be moved over to the John Campia show tomorrow. So if you sent in a question to the tip link in the last hour, don't freak out if you don't see it answered on today's open mic. It's probably already been moved over to be used on the John Campia show tomorrow. And once we are done getting through all the remaining tip questions, we will go over, open up the super chats for just a little bit and hear what you guys who are watching live have to say. A uh, big, big day today of news. We talked about the Tom Cruise situation a little bit earlier, which I think is really neat. So for those of you who missed it, we covered a story today that was in the Hollywood Reporter about Tom Cruise specifically requested he wanted to watch The Flash because David Zaslav talked it off. I guess him and David Zaslav, the head of Warner Brothers, met. And David Zaslav just couldn't stop talking about how good The Flash is. So Tom Cruise said, I I'd like to see it. So David Zaslav sent a WB employee over to Tom Cruise's house with the movie was there while Tom Cruise watched the movie and then took it back. And apparently Tom Cruise was wowed by it, loved it so much. He looked up Andy Muschietti's phone number, called him directly to rave about it. And Tom Cruise apparently said, it is everything you want in a movie. And the second thing he said was the exact kind of movie that we need today or, or, or something along those lines, which is pretty damn cool. Mm. Pretty damn cool. So that was exciting to hear. And uh, I'm now four weeks away from watching The Flash because I'm going to watch it at CinemaCon with a bunch of other people. I'm sure some people are going to see it before CinemaCon. We'll probably hear some reactions coming out about it before CinemaCon. And uh, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, guys, let's get over. And hello to everybody in the live chat from uh, Dr. Stinky, Ron H., Adrian James, Matt Sanders, uh, Infeliz, all you guys in the live chat. Thank you for being here today. And let's get rolling into the questions you guys have sent in. We're going to start off here with an anonymous viewer who writes, Hey, crew, I saw Shazam this weekend. It was fun. But damn, my theater looked like it was the second weekend of Quantum Mania. Yikes. Yeah, I mean... That's the thing. I went to go see Shazam 2, Fury of the Gods. I, listen, I loved it. I mean, not as much as the first one, but I had a really good time watching it. But one of the things I said in my initial review was, this movie's going to tank. And despite the fact that I really, really enjoy it a lot. I think it's wonderful. Uh, David Sandberg, who, who directed the film, did a wonderful job. But it's going to tank. And... When we went to go see it, um, the theater was not full. I mean, it wasn't empty, but it wasn't full. And you could just sort of feel, and the audience had a great time. But yeah, man, we talked about it on the show this morning, the movie made less than Morbius did on its opening weekend. The only DC movies that it made more money than, in the, the only movies it made more than in the comic book genre of the last couple of years were Super Pets. And the Suicide Squad and the Suicide Squad was released on HBO Max for free at the same time that it was put in movie theaters. It's not good, man. It's not good. And it's really a shame because the movie is wonderful. Uh, but yeah, it is tanking and tanking hard, my friends. All right, let's get going here. Next up, we've got one from Wicked Man who writes, who I think will be the Avengers team, Sam Wilson, Shang-Chi, Spider-Man, She-Hulk, Captain Marvel, and Daredevil. I don't think Daredevil's going to be on the Avengers. I, I agree with all the right. I think Sam Wilson will definitely be on the Avengers. Not leading it, but he'll be on the Avengers. Shang-Chi definitely will be an Avenger. Spider-Man will definitely be an Avenger. She-Hulk, 70% sure She-Hulk will be an Avenger. 70%, not 100% sure. Captain Marvel, 100%. But Daredevil, I don't know. I have a feeling they might keep Daredevil 
a little more street level um, like that. So I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. All right. Next up. Uh, Wicked Man also writes, I rewatched No Country for Old Men. That movie's so good. It's incredible. My second favorite movie behind Goodfellas. Yeah, I mean, listen, it won Javier Bardem, an Academy Award. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones is absolutely breathtakingly fantastic in it. It's friendo. Um, it's it's brilliant. And the ending is chilling. And, you know, we sometimes we talk about movies where the bad guy wins and we'll often point to like Avengers Infinity War or something, but you could point to No Country for Old Men first. <laughs> All right. Next up. Uh, Red One Real Talk writes, uh, D&D was freaking awesome. D&D is Dungeons and Dragons, for those of you who don't know. This movie defined what it is to be a geek, and I can't wait to see it again. Just disappointed that I didn't have the same excitement watching Shazam on Friday night. Yeah, listen, if you were to ask me which movie did I prefer, Dungeons and Dragons or Shazam 2, Dungeons and Dragons. I liked it more. Like, I, I really liked Shazam, Fury of the Gods. I really liked it, but I liked Dungeons and Dragons more. And here's the funny thing, or a sad thing, depending on how you look, look at it. I am not convinced that Dungeons and Dragons is going to do much better at the box office than Shazam 2 did. I, I certainly hope it does. It certainly deserves it, but I'm, I'm just not sure yet. I, I don't have a sense of how big or not big this movie is going to be with people. Because while it totally appeals to nerds like me and those of us who play Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of stuff and has been playing it since I was a kid or whatever, I, I don't know if a lot of people are going to look at it and go, yeah, that's a movie I want to go see if they don't have any experience with Dungeons and Dragons. You know what I mean? So I hope it does well. I think if it makes 30 plus million dollars, they should be happy with it. But yeah, man. I, I, I just don't know at this point. It could open to 60 million and I won't be surprised. It could open to 20 million and I won't be surprised. So fingers crossed because the movie's really good. If you haven't had a chance to see it, take Red One Real Talks advice and go and check it out. All right. Uh, Benji Husky writes, I'm guilty on why superhero box office numbers are low. I just don't get hype for this repetitive, saturated genre anymore. I just wait for this for it to be on streaming now. Yeah, you know, but it's the same of everything, right? Like, how many cop movies are there? Answer, a lot. How many, you know, the, the key is, do you keep making them fresh and different and new? As we went through, you know, Marvel MCU phases one, two, and three, and even to a degree in phase four as well. Lots of comic book movies, but they found a way to make them all feel unique. You know, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, Captain America... Winter Soldier was like a 70s political drama. Um, Doctor Strange was part horror, part something else. Uh, the first Ant-Man was like a heist movie. Then, the, the, I mean, they made every movie feel a little bit different. And then even into Phase 4 a little bit, WandaVision was totally and completely different. Ms. Marvel is totally and completely different from anything they've done. But it's not so much that I've been getting tired of the comic book movies or even tired of the MCU. It's just that when the quality starts to wane... Fans like to look for formulas or excuses. Like there, I, I still completely, like there are still people who think that the reason Shazam didn't do well is because there are people who know that there may not be another Shazam movie. Therefore, they're not sure what the point is of going to go see this Shazam movie. Nonsense. That's not the way average everyday movie going people think. That is just not the way they think. And I pointed out on the show this morning, like, it, that's completely disproven by the results of Black Adam. Because when Black Adam came out, everybody thought the DCU was continuing. Everybody thought Henry Cavill was back. Everybody thought The Rock was going to be instituting a new hierarchy of power in the DCU, all that kind of stuff. And it still financially fell on its face. So that movie just came out. So you can't all of a sudden say, well, now this one failed because this... Black Adam proves otherwise. The, 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 the DC movies are falling on their faces right now. And by the way, I liked Black Adam. Just, just, just to be clear, I'm not sitting here trying to bash on Black Adam. I liked Black Adam. It had its problems, but I liked it. But we all look for formulas, right? When really, when it comes to like the comic book movies and stuff like that, it's really less about, well, it's repetitive. The movies just haven't been as quality. It always just comes down to quality. 
And, you know, somebody wrote in on the John Campus show earlier this morning asking if, you know, Marvel should pivot away and do some Elseworld movies. But the problem is if you're making only okay to mediocre movies, making an okay to mediocre Elseworld movie isn't going to solve your problem. The, the problem is always just in the quality of the film. There's no other formula. Whether it's how many films built up to it, how many more films are coming after it, who starred in it, blah, blah, blah. Like all these things are just you know, trinkets, it all, it's not really about the formula. It's about, are you creating quality movies? And I'd say people start to feel like they're getting tired of it. Once the quality comes down, as long as the quality's high, like you look at, again, go back to the MCU phases one, two, and three, 20 plus movies, all that kind of stuff. People are why? Because the movies were great. And it's not a coincidence that people start talking about after 15 years, start talking about, oh, maybe there's comp with movie fatigue. It's not a coincidence that people start talking about that around the same time that the quality of the movies have been coming down a little bit, right? It's not a coincidence. But yeah, I mean, when the quality, when the product isn't great, people will, it'll lose favor with the people, man. And that's the way it should be. But here's hoping. I said that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has lost its magic, but the magic can come back just like that if Guardians of the Galaxy 3 knocks it out of the park. Whether it will or won't, we'll find out. All right, uh, next up here, we got Jay who writes, uh, from these characters listed below, can you say which supporting character is your least favorite and who's your most? Louise from Ant-Man, Ned from Spider-Man, Korg from Thor, uh, Alexi from Black Widow, uh, Karun from The Eternals, uh, Katie from Shang-Chi. Ooh, I like all of them. It's tough. It would be, oh, a tie for my favorite between Alexi from Black Widow. That's Red Guard. I believe Alexi is Red Guardian, right? Correct me if I'm wrong in the live chat. I believe Alexi is Red Guardian. I freaking love David Harbour. David Harbour was the best part of the Black Widow movie. That character is awesome. And when I found out that Red Guardian was going to be in Thunderbolts, that's when I got excited about Thunderbolts. Also finding out that Bucky was going to be into it, was going to be in it too. Um, so it's kind of a tie between those two. My least favorite, man, Karun was really fun too, but Karun was the least impactful one. Like Alexi had a direct impact on the narrative and story of the of uh, Black Widow. Katie had a direct, immediate, primary impact on the story of Shang Chi. Karun, while wonderful had the least impact. So if I had to take one away from those, Jay, I think it would be Karun, even though I loved him. Thank you, sir. I loved him. He was great. But I think he's the one who's most expendable on that list. All right, thanks. For, good question, Jay. Thanks for sending that in. All right, Jake Clark writes, Warner Brothers have nine months and the money. Reshoot Mara's scenes in Aquaman 2 with Deborah Ann Wool. Oh, no, that's stupid. Deserved after... Uh, what WB did to, nah, you know what? No, I'm not, I'm not doing any more of that. Now, like the depth, take the depth stuff out of here. Listen, let's not pretend like the, everybody forgets this. Johnny Depp was problematic. And I, I say, I was, I was just talking about Johnny Depp in um, the Willy Wonka movie earlier today. I am, I am, I, you guys have watched my show for years. I'm a big Johnny Depp fan, but Johnny Depp was also considered in Hollywood to be quite problematic before that. And let's not forget, let's not forget, Johnny Depp lost his his court case in the UK. He won the one in North America, which I, I, I don't know what that does, but he lost the one in the UK. And so... Uh, no, Warner Brothers isn't going to go and reshoot all the scenes with a different actress. And no, uh, they're they're not they're not going to all do that. Listen, to be honest with you, they probably should have. I can't remember had they shot Aquaman two by the time all the the nonsense and drama between Depp and Hurd had started. I think they didn't. Honestly, and and this is not a point of guilt or innocence on anybody's part, but honestly. I, I remember saying that I they probably should do the movie without her, not as a not as a punishment to her, because whenever you have the he said she said bullshit, and let's face it, this always comes down to he said she said. I I would try to distance if I was Warner Brothers, I would have distanced myself from that. And I just, that's why even today I was 100% behind Warner Brothers separating themselves from Johnny Depp, but I also think they should have. 
again, not a pointing of guilt or innocence on anybody, just saying your drama, like you two, your drama, I don't want to make it if I'm Warner Brothers. I don't want to make it my drama. So we're going to move on for now in, in a different direction. Let's come back and revisit everything. I, I think it probably would have been prudent. Again, not Warner Brothers judging anybody, but just saying, you guys have a lot of drama and we don't want your drama splashing over on us. So we're going to separate ourselves from you guys um, for now, just because we don't want your drama to become our drama. And you guys figure that out with your court cases, whether it's the one in the UK, the US, whatever. You do you and let's all talk after the, the dust settles. I think maybe they should have done it without her. Again, not as a condemnation on her. I just think maybe it would have been good business to do it without her. Eh, just a thought. But now going back at this point, because all you're going to do now, if you go back at this point and reshoot now, you're just making, adding far more unreasonable expense. And by the way, nobody knows how Alchemy 2 is going to do at the box office. So you don't want to add more money to the expense of it. And all you're going to do is you're going to bring the drama of it all to the forefront. Warner Brothers right now wants nothing more than for the Depp Heard drama to kind of stay quieted down so they can just talk about their movie. If they all of a sudden come out now and do this, all it's going to do is make it about not Aquaman again. It's just going to make it about their drama again. And I, I don't think that's what they want to do. Now, listen, I this is just one random fan sitting in a room somewhere giving their random opinions and thoughts on it. Don't take what I have to say about it as any kind of gospel. That's just kind of the way I see it, but it is the way I see it. All right. Anyway, next up, uh, let's see here. Kylo Ken writes, John, I just have a quick question about your news stories about box office numbers. Is there a reason you only use domestic box office numbers? Oh, we don't. We always use global numbers, except for when we're talking about opening weekend, but we'll talk about that in a second. Is there a reason you only use domestic box office, office numbers? Many times the film's worldwide box office numbers are double its domestic number. Those dollars don't seem to matter. No, 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 no. You're completely incorrect about that, Kylo. When we talk about box office for a movie, we always talk about global box office. Like when we say that, uh, uh, for instance, we were just talking about Black Adam. I said Black Adam couldn't hit 400 million. That's globally. When we talk about, you know, uh, Top Gun Maverick made 1.4 billion. That's globally. We always talk in terms of global box office when we talk about box office all the time. The only exception to that is when we're talking about opening weekend. An opening weekend, you have to only talk about domestic. Why, you might say? Because domestic is the only level playing ground. Here's what I mean. Every movie opens in different countries at different times. So let's say Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania may open in North America and 21 other countries on its opening weekend. Well, then... Scream 6 may have opened in North America and only three other countries on the same weekend. Whereas Creed 3 may have opened in, by the way, I'm just using uh, like uh, hypothetical numbers here. Creed 3 may have opened in North America and in 16 other countries on the same day. It's completely pointless to talk about the global opening weekend numbers when every movie opens in a different number of countries on its weekend, you know, uh, Creed three may have opened in the U S and in the UK on the same day, but scream six may have opened in the U S and then the UK two weeks later. So you can't compare it when you're talking about the final box office numbers, then you could compare it. Once a movie's done its, its global theatrical run, then you can talk about box office and we always talk in terms of the total global box office take. But with opening weekends, it's pointless. It's pointless to say that movie A made $100 million on its opening weekend when it opened in 45 countries and movie B made $30 million opening weekend globally when it only opened in five countries. You can't do that. That's why... Yeah, when we're talking about opening weekend box office numbers and opening weekend records, you always talk in terms of domestic box office. But when we talk about overall box office at the end of the day, 
overall boxes, we always talk globally. So that's how we make the distinction and, and why we do that. Anyway, good question. I'm glad you asked if you weren't sure about that, Kylo. All right. Next up, Tracy writes, I'm a big comic movie fan, but I just had no interest in Shazam 2. I saw the first one and it was fine, but it felt aimed at a younger audience. That's fine. There's room for those. Just not for me. Might also be a target audience willing to wait to stream. I don't think it's a target audience willing to wait to stream, but I think it's exactly what you're talking about, Tracy. The reality is whenever you hear me talk about the first Shazam movie, what do I always say? Admittedly, I love this movie more than most people do. Now, the first movie has a 90% critic rating and like an 83% audience rating, right? Huge ratings. But that just means a percentage of people who liked it. It is not. If you guys saw our editorial video on uh, how Rotten Tomatoes works and the five big misconceptions about Rotten Tomatoes, a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes does not mean that the critics say the movie's a 9 out of 10. It simply means that 90% of the critics liked it. How much they liked it who knows, but it just means they at least liked it. 83% of the audience liked it. Now, maybe they just liked it barely, or maybe they thought it was the greatest movie of all time, but it just tells us how many people liked it. It could very well be that a lot of people with the first, like I loved it, but it could be that a lot of people with the first Shazam movie just kind of thought, oh yeah, it was good. It was good. I liked it. I, you know, I watched it and I liked it, but I don't really feel the need to rush out and watch another one. You add on top of that, the stench of failure coming off of Black Adam, which I also liked, but the stench of failure coming off Black Adam, you add on top of that, the fact that people just don't seem to care about the DCU anymore. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different factors, but, but I think there are people like you, Tracy, very legitimately who were just like, yeah, you know what? I thought the first one was fine, but I didn't feel the need to run out and watch the second one. I mean, there are people like me who love the first one and people like you who just thought it was okay. And I think that's very, very valid. All right. Let's see. Next up. Uh, Tracy also writes, also got to see Dungeons and Dragons, which is awesome. Uh, movie Saturday. And it was so, so much fun. Highly recommend. Lots to love for hardcore D&D fans, casual fans, and non-players. Great cast, good story and effects. If you are at all curious, I'd say definitely check it out. You know what, Tracy? I'm glad you brought up the effects because I'm going to mention one really bad thing about the Dungeons and Dragons movie, okay? And only those of you who saw the movie will know what I'm talking about. And I'm not, I'm not going to give any specific context just so you guys don't know what's going on. But in the movie, there are just like, it's a fantasy realm, you know, just like Middle Earth and Lord of the Rings is a fantasy realm. So there are dwarves and there are elves and, and there are like uh, Hobbit-like characters. Here's my one negative thing. In the movie, there appears a Hobbit-like character, okay? Like, so a, a, a small, a halfling, if you will, right? And that's exactly what they're called in D&D, halflings. So there's a halfling in it, right? Who's kind of like D&D's version of, uh, um, of, uh, of hobbits. What really stood out to me was that the visual effects for hobbits in a 20-year-old Lord of the Rings film was 100 times better than the halfling effects in today's movie. I mean, that's that it's because when they had, I mean, the, by the way, the scene with the halfling was wonderful, wonderful scene, but it was a badly done visual effect because the hobbits and Lord of the Rings from 20 years ago looked way better. Other than that, the movie's fantastic, guys. It's so much fun. And you know, what's one of the cool thing is, and uh, Matt's asking, was a CGI? No, it was, it was a human actor just, you know, use visual effects to make it look like they were small, like they did in Lord of the Rings. They just did it much, much better in a 20 year old Lord of the Rings. Anyway, um, what's really interesting, because you mentioned, you know, for hardcore D&D fans, casual D&D fans, this is the funny thing. I did my right out of the theater review for Dungeons and Dragons. And I'd say like almost 30%, and maybe I'm not remembering right, but it felt like almost 30% of the comments were people who saw it and have never played Dungeons and Dragons in their lives and loved it. Cause I was worried only people like us who play D and D would, would have found it so entertaining. But the comment section on my out of the theater reaction video 
is filled with people saying, I've never even, I don't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons. I've never played Dungeons and Dragons. And this movie is fantastic. And that was one of the best things to hear. That was one of the best things to hear. And guys, video games are great. Mobile tablet games are great. The Switch is awesome. The PlayStation is fabulous. Whatever. Nothing, nothing beats actually being in a room with your friends, sitting down and playing a tabletop role-playing game. Whether it's a Star Wars role-playing game, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, I don't care. Nothing beats it. Video games are great. Video games are fantastic. They do not beat getting together in real life with your friends at a table, having some drinks, having a good time, and playing D&D. Play a role-playing game with your friends. It's 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 just awesome. Anyway, all right. Uh, next up, Wicked Man writes, Hey, John, uh, I don't know if you know, but Khabib's cousin, Zumar and Usman, oh yeah, and, and a lot of the people in his club uh, are also an MMA. In fact, uh, Usman is the Bellator champ. The whole cadre of that fighting club are world-class and and after and Khabib's dad was kind of the patriarch of that whole thing, and all of them are champions, and none of them does anybody want to fight. It's it's really crazy. There's quite a fighting lineage there, like really quite a fighting lineage. All right, uh, last one we got, and then we'll be uh, wrapped up with our tip questions. Comes to us from Diego, who writes, Victoria Alonso. Now, okay, okay, so. I'm not going to comment on this much because this just happened while the show was going on. We will definitely make this a main topic on tomorrow's show. I've been busy in meetings and all that kind of stuff today. I haven't had a chance to really sit down and go into, of course, Victoria Alonso of Marvel has now left the company. And so I'm not going to be able to comment on it much right here, but we'll finish reading your question, Diego. Uh, Victoria Alonso's sudden departure from Marvel, whether it's at her own will or at the behest of Iger, uh, Bob Iger and Feige, I do believe is in response to the VFX issues. I do not believe it is. I do not believe it is, but we'll talk about that more later. Uh, to the VFX issue and is needed to help repair the relationship with VFX workers, Iger pushing for accountability. Um, I don't believe that th that's it at all. As a matter of fact... Victoria Alonso was considered by many to maybe be Feige's heir apparent to taking over Marvel once he's done. Um, so I, I'm not, I don't believe that's the case. Uh, plus you got to remember Marvel doesn't really have visual effects workers. Marvel subcontracts out to other visual effects companies, visual effects companies bid on jobs that Marvel puts up for tenure and it's the companies that com constantly underbid each other, pushing their profit margins down to almost nothing, sometimes less than nothing, creates unreasonable work hours for the workers and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the companies. They need to organize. visual, And I say this to somebody who used to work in the visual effects industry. They need to organize. I'm not necessarily saying you can unionize, but do something like the DGA does. Like which, which I guess technically is a union. So, so there you go. But like the producers guild of America, the directors guild of America, I think either VFX artists themselves or the VFX companies need to create some sort of organization to make like IATSE, you need to create some kind of organization that guarantees the working conditions, the compensation, like all that kind of stuff for people in your field. I do not believe Victoria Alonso is the one that is going to take the fall for that because for, for several different reasons. But again, I, ask me again. Remember, this news dropped while we were doing the show. I've been in meetings since doing the show. So maybe my mind will change once I get more information because I haven't had a chance to get garner a lot, but I just don't see how she would be connected to that. But again, we will talk more about her departure on, um, on tomorrow's show. We'll talk more about that. But I, I personally, right now, in the dark, I don't believe she had any that had anything to do with the VFX issue at all. But again, we all change our opinions and perspectives once we gain new information. So we'll, we'll see as that uh, transpires. Okay, 
Guys, with that now down, we are going to open up the Super Chats for those of you guys who are watching live. If you're watching live and have a question that you would like to send in via Super Chat, go ahead and do that. I'm only going to leave the Super Chat open just for a couple of minutes, guys. Uh, but in the meantime, and before we get to those Super Chats, we're going to take a second and thank a couple of the sponsors of this episode of Open Mic, our friends at Fume and, of course, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's video, Fume. Be smart. Don't start. Kick the habit. Put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times yet, we still continue to have bad habits. And I know all of you guys completely relate with me when I say kicking bad habits feel like it's impossible. Well, thankfully, our sponsor Fume is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. And understand, Fume is is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. And Fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and Fume is designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They have thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions simply don't work. So head to tryfume.com and use the code CAMPIA to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version Tomb Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfume.com and use the code CAMPIA to save an additional 10% off on your order today. We want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. You guys know I made the switch over to Mint Mobile a while ago. The process couldn't have been easier and I can't believe that I am spending less than a third of what I was spending on one of the other major carriers before. By going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail, Mint Mobile passes the significant savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily in minutes with eSIM. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia that's mintmobile.com slash campia cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia and thank you to our friends at fume and of course mint mobile for sponsoring the john campia youtube channel remember guys make sure you go and check out our sponsors check out the promo codes because when you support them you're actually supporting us all right that down let's get to some of the questions you guys have been sending in here we'll see if we can get this on screen in an appropriate way um yeah we got a couple of them here okay we're gonna start off with where are we at uh the daniels oh who's this come from this comes to us from spencer smothers who writes the daniels are directing an episode of skeleton crew source the hollywood reporter if that's true that's awesome I love that. I'm very excited to see Skeleton Crew. Uh, they've got terrific showrunner. I love Jude Law. I think the premise is kind of interesting and having the Daniels direct an episode would be fantastic, Spencer. All right, next up, James Argento writes. Uh, hearing Ray laugh, oh no, no, uh, James Argento writes, Oh, that was James Argento. Sorry. Uh, CJ Rebirth writes, hearing Ray laugh in Shazam 2 scene was awesome. Yeah, so CJ Rebirth was also in the uh, screening of Shazam that we were in. And you could definitely hear Ray laughing out loud through the audience. It was pretty fun. All right. Patrick Hamilton writes, uh, hoping Sam Neill beats this cancer. One of my favorite actors. Yeah. Sam Neill uh, recently made some comments. I guess he said he's, he's doing well. He doesn't want to, he said something along the lines of he doesn't want to linger on it. Um, but he is so great from everybody. Obviously will think of, you know, Jurassic park, I think of him in things like Hunt for Red October, and I think of him in things like, um, well, he played a great Cardinal as well. 
I, I just love Sam Neill and here's hoping for the best for him for sure. All right. Matt Sanders writes some support, uh, support. Thanks. Shazam was a seven out of 10. I really liked Shazam. Uh, a lot. So you can get people's names in there. There we go. I really like Shazam a lot. I, I, you know, if I did give numerical scores, which I do not do anymore, but if I was somebody who gave numerical scores out, I would probably also probably give it something in a seven out of 10. I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it. Again, not as good as the first one to me though. All right. Walter Whitewalker writes, uh, Bo looks great for being older than Obi-Wan in episode four. Um, yeah, I that's the thing. I remember somebody else wrote about that because in the actual timeline, if you can go in the end, Bo Katan, I believe, is supposed to be older than Obi-Wan Kenobi. And um, yeah, uh, Katie looks great. There's there's no getting around that. Katie looks absolutely great. She really does. All right, Big Mouth Stan writes, why didn't Thanos go for the Infinity Stones in 2012, but instead waited till 2018 when there were more Avengers and superpower beings to go through? My theory about that has always been, and, and it could be completely wrong. This is just me as a fan theorizing. I believe it's because Odin was still there. That's my theory. My theory is that Odin was still there. Remember, Thor nearly took down Thanos, and Odin handles can handle Thor like that. Like he even just just like that stripped away all Thor's power. Um, I believe it was because of Odin. I, I I think Marvel has always underplayed just how big, powerful, and badass the All Father was. It's why Thor, and to a degree Loki, would go around and have it right in their name, Thor, Odin's son. I mean, that is their naming mechanic, yes, but I, I think that's big. And I always thought it was because Odin was still around. I think as soon as Odin was gone, then he could make his move. Again, that's just a guess and a theory of mine. If Kevin Feige were here and I posed that to him, maybe he would say that's totally not true. But, you know, I don't know. All right. Uh, next up, CJ Rebirth writes, uh, in the theater... I meant, uh, great seeing you three again. Well, thank you, CG Rebirth. Yeah, and it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, the movie is is a great deal of fun, but I got to tell you, I love watching movies with Ray. Uh, yes, he does fall asleep a lot uh, in a lot of different movies, but watching a movie with Ray is every bit as entertaining uh, as you think it might be. All right, let's keep going here. Next up. We got Trevor, who sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you, Trevor, for supporting us on that level, man. And Trevor writes, as someone who has only played a little Pathfinder, I really like D&D Honor Among Thieves. Reminding me of The Princess Bride, heartfelt story with good action and humor. I think that is a, a perfect comparison. I think the comparison to A Princess Bride is, is absolutely on point. It had kind of that spirit of it. You know, the, the charm the heart. I mean, look, I don't think as much as I like this Dungeons and Dragons movie, I do not think it's going to become one of the all time classic films that we are going to be talking about 30 years from now, like we do with Princess Bride. I I'm not saying that, but it definitely has a number of those elements, Trevor. And, and I think that is a really nice comparison because I felt that same kind of charm just with a little bit more swearing, <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit more swearing in it, Trevor, than than Princess Bride had. All right. Miguel Zayn writes, Hey, John, who do you think among these three are most likely to do a one and done Star Wars film? Fincher, zero. Nolan, zero. Cameron, zero. Any preference minus Fincher. All of them, absolute zero chance. Any of them will do anything like that. Um, Cameron and Lucas have become like really, really good friends and respected. Um, I'm not going to say colleagues, but respected people in their field amongst each other. So even though I think all three of them are absolute zero chance, I'd say Cameron maybe is the one that had a 1% chance. And honestly, my preference would be Cameron. I love Fincher, but Fincher's style is not well suited for a Star Wars universe necessarily. I would say thing about the same thing about Christopher Nolan. I love Christopher Nolan, but I don't think he's suited for a Star Wars story. So I think the most likely would be Cameron. And if I had to pick one, it would probably be Cameron. But again, I, I, it's no chance any of the three of them ever do it. All right. Eddie Burton writes, 
Saw another hype post from Snyder about his Snyderverse. At this point, should he just stop and move on so fans can too? I, You know what, Eddie? I'm just not paying any attention to it. I, if there's news and when there's news, we'll talk about it. Until then, I'm paying no attention to it. All right, Big Mouth Stan writes, maybe if Mando ratings keep tanking, we'll get an announcement for future Star Wars movies. Listen, they, here's the thing. With Bob Iger back... They are going to put a priority on the Star Wars movies. Even though Bob Iger was the initial one to say, hey, maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit on, on how many movies we're putting in production, how quickly we're having movies come out. But I don't think Bob Iger ever envisioned they'd go four or five years without a new Star Wars movie in theaters. Like, it's one thing to slow down, which personally, I also thought they needed to slow down. It's another thing to go four years or five years or maybe even six years by the time we get one in theaters. So I think a new Star Wars movie announcement is coming. Um, it's probably going to end up being the um, the Taika Waititi one or maybe the one uh, Lost, the guy who does Lost. Uh, um, why am I freezing on his name? Lindelof. Uh, probably sounds like the Lindelof one has some momentum, but yeah, we'll see. It won't be connected to the to the current the current struggles of Mandalorian. Let's let's put it that way. All right, Boone Lee Tan writes. Ted Lasso uh, cast are on CNN for White House briefing. Okay, not quite sure exactly what that means, but all right. Uh, Sneaky kitten writes. Hey John, uh, how comes the Rock didn't? Hold on. Hi John, how comes the Rock? just didn't appear in Shazam 2019 first and then spin off from there. I think that would have worked better thoughts. It absolutely 100% should have worked better. And listen, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is my second favorite movie star in the world. I am very, very biased for Dwayne Johnson. But I've always felt that he... Look, I've always understood that he felt that Black Adam should not be a character that's in anybody else's shadow. I, and I've understood that and I respect that and I get it. But Shazam and Black Adam are yin and yang. And there was a little bit of Black Adam in the first Shazam. Remember when, when the wizards are telling the story of the history, they tell the story of the first one to have that power, Black Adam, and you saw a little bit of him in the sand form. But... The reason he was is because Dwayne The Rock Johnson wouldn't let them. Dwayne The Rock Johnson wanted to be Black Adam. He wanted Black Adam to be completely separate from Shazam. Uh, maybe later down the road, Black Adam and Shazam could cross over. But if you're asking why didn't they do it, it's because The Rock didn't want them to. And I've always, I love The Rock. I love Dwayne Johnson. But I've always disagreed with him on that. Again, I get it. It's understandable. Uh, you want this character to be seen in his own light. You think the character is good enough, and, and he is. The character should be seen as his own standalone character, and I totally get that, and I totally understand that. I just think maybe there is a way to do it while incorporating him with Shazam. Um, I mean, listen, he still had to say the word, right? He still had to say Shazam. So, yeah, I, I don't know, but but that's why. That's why, Sneaky Kitten. All right, just a couple more here. Uh, I have, I've turned off the super chats just so you guys know because we're almost uh, wrapped up for time here. Uh, next up, we got Dr. Stinky writes, Saw Shazam, um, where are we at? Oh yeah, Saw Shazam, great film. I think some of the dialogue was campy, but I loved it. One issue is Billy Batson is more mature and has a deeper voice than Zach. See, I here's my, th I said this on the John Campus show earlier today. I've often heard the criticism that Zach Levi as Shazam acts younger than Billy Batson does as the young teenager. I disagree. And I think when you look at the movie Shazam Fury of the Gods, first of all, Billy Batson isn't in the movie very much. And when he is, Billy is usually in a very different set of circumstances. He's never in a panicked circumstance. He, Whenever we see Billy, he's in a fairly calm moment, whether he's just talking to one of his family members or all that kind of stuff. And when Zach Levi and Shazam is on screen, there's a crisis going on. And so the character, 
let's forget the fact that there are two different actors. Okay. Let's say, let's just say we have the character, Billy Batson, just like you and me, Billy's going to act one way and come across a certain way in calm, non-crisis environments. Talk like this, blah, blah, blah. But when a crisis comes up, yeah, blah, 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 right. It's, it's different. And that's why I don't, I don't see it as I personally, just me only speaking for myself. I don't per personally see a discrepancy between the Billy Batson persona and the Shazam persona, because we're often seeing them in two very different contexts. And yeah, again, I, I don't think you're wrong to, to think that I don't think you're wrong to believe that, you know, they're acting way too different. Cause I think there are other people who believe that as well. But uh, for me, I, I didn't see it as a discrepancy myself. All right. Last question of the day. Uh, we get to Q O O T 32 O T 32 writes, uh, average viewers are getting tired of comic book movies. I don't believe so. Bad scripts, uh, excursive. You probably mean excessive, excessive nonsense. CGI don't see average viewers back unless for X-Men and Deadpool. I, again, I disagree. Average movie go mo movie goers are not getting tired of comic book movies. They're getting tired as they always have of lackluster movies. That's the key. They're getting tired of lackluster movies. And quite often we see a movie open up well, like say Avatar 2, right? But Avatar 2 did not, remember, Avatar 2 is the second biggest, third biggest film in cinematic history, right? But it had a not amazing opening weekend. Like, actually, let me pull it up here. Um, Avatar 2 box office. How much... Uh, did it make opening weekend? It wasn't outstanding. It was $134 million. Okay. Consider this. Avatar 2, The Way of Water, made less opening weekend than The Batman. The Batman actually made more money opening weekend than Avatar 2. Because I, I think the, the Batman made $135. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It made about $135. So... The thing is, though, Avatar 2, people loved it, and they kept going back, and they brought other people to go see it, and on and on and on and on and on. People are not getting tired of comic book movies. They're getting tired of mediocrity. Because, again, I'll say this again. You can disagree with me all you want, but there is not a coincidence that while all the movies for 15 years, while all the movies were like, for the most part, like three out of every four comic book movies were wonderful, right? For like 15 years, three out of every four were, especially coming out of Marvel, were fantastic and people loved them. And so the box offices are high and high and high and high and high and high. It's not a coincidence that now as we enter into a phase where Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness was a little bit divisive, still almost made a billion dollars. Doctor Strange or Thor Love and Thunder had a lot of people that didn't like the movie. Guess what? That movie still made over $700 million. But then Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania comes out and it's not a good movie and it drops. She-Hulk was on TV. It was a comedy that wasn't funny. Hawkeye, I thought, was a disappointment. Like, it's not a coincidence that when the movies stop being great, the numbers drop. So you can, you can pretend... Like it's a total coincidence that for 15 years, while all the movies were bangers, the numbers were high. And now that the, eh, the quality is only so, so now that the numbers are coming down, you can pretend that's a coincidence. It's not a coincidence because I'll tell you what, I've been doing this job a long time. Do you know this July will be my 20th year doing online film punditry? My very first movie post was in June or July. I think it was July of 2003. I did a post about the movie, the upcoming movie Seabiscuit. That was my very, very first post. But in the 20 years that I've been doing this, every single year, every single year, particularly once the MCU started, but remember, comic book movies have been around a lot before the MCU started. But every single year, ah, uh, comic book movie fatigue setting in. 
comic book movie fatigue, and then a bunch of huge hits. So then the next year, oh, comic book movie fatigue, comic book movie fatigue setting in this year. And sure enough, massive, massive box office. So then the next year, oh, comic book movie fatigue, going to set in now. And then next year, and then next year, and then next year for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. It's the same thing. I've seen it so many times. Comic book movie fatigue, comic book movie fatigue, comic book movie fatigue, comic book movie fatigue, comic book movie fatigue for 20 years. And it's, I'm telling you, it is not a coincidence that when we finally see those numbers, those impervious, invincible numbers starting to come down, it's at the same time that the quality of the movie and the product has been dropping. It's not a coincidence. I guarantee you, I 1000% guarantee you that if Eternals was as hugely crowd and critic pleasing and box office successful as phases one, two, and three were, if Black Widow was as hugely successful with the audience and the critics, if uh, uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was as hugely overwhelmingly positive with audiences and critics, if Thor Love and Thunder was as hugely overwhelmingly loved by the audiences and the critics as all, almost all of the films in phases one through three, the box office numbers would be skyrocketing right now. 100%. 100%. The box office numbers would be skyrocketing right now. But... They're not. Thor Love and Thunder was not as beloved as Ragnarok. Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness was not as beloved as Doctor Strange. Eternals, as much as I like it, was not universally beloved by people. Black Widow was quite frankly pretty disappointing. And then not to mention an Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania is not good. I mean, it's, it's all subjective, of course. I'm just giving you my opinion, but... You know, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania was not good. And that's not even to talk about the disappointments they've had on Disney+. Plus. They've had a couple of big winners like WandaVision and, and Ms. Marvel. But for every WandaVision and Ms. Marvel, you had Moon Knight, which ended up being kind of disappointing. Hawkeye, which was pretty disappointing. Again, just my own perspective. She-Hulk was pretty disappointing. I mean, again, you can pretend like it's a coincidence that the quality drop has nothing to do with the box office result drop, I am 100% telling you this no coincidence. It's all tied together. So, and again, you just got to understand, I've just, I've been doing this job for nearly 20 years. Not full time for 20 years, granted, but I've been doing this job for nearly 20 years and I, I've just seen it. I've seen this whole thing, comic book movie fatigue. People are getting tired of comic book movies. Oh, people are so tired of the superhero movies now. I've been hearing that every year for 20 years and for every year, they just rule the box office because the quality was always sky high compared to other general movie offerings, right? Like I said, minimum three out of every four with the MCU, four out of every five movies were absolute huge crowd pleasers and huge critic pleasers. And so the box office would be great. The last couple of years, not so much. And I'm a big MCU fan. And I'm telling you, their quality has come down. And it's no coincidence that the box office results come down. It's not that people are getting tired. People never get tired of cop movies. People never get tired of murder mysteries. People never get tired of medical drama shows. They're always coming out. What happens is they get tired of product that isn't top shelf. And when your product stops being top shelf, people get tired of mediocre product. And that's what the comic book genre is right now. It's, it's, it's mediocre product. Every once in a while, they have something really good like Ms. Marvel or the Batman. Uh, otherwise they're putting out stuff like Black Adam and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania and She-Hulk. It's not a recipe for success. Not a recipe for success. But again, we as film fans, we try to look for some kind of scapegoat, right? It's, it's comic book movie fatigue. It's this. It's, it's the fact that they didn't origin stories. It's the fact that it, it just always comes down to the quality of the product. It always does. And so, anyway, that's, that's just kind of my take on it at any rate. All right, guys. That'll do it for today's installment of Open Mic. Thank you so much for being here and making this little afternoon show a part of your day. I'm incredibly honored that you decided to spend some time here today. By the way, guys, once again, don't forget, 
you can send in a question or topic for the John Campia show or open mic, whatever. And you can send in your questions anytime, 24 seven. You don't have to wait until a show is live. Just go to the tip link at streamelements.com slash movie blog TV slash tip. You can send in questions or topics right now, and they're going to be on the John Campia show tomorrow. Again, as long as your questions and comments and topics are appropriate. Um, yeah. So, and guys, that'll do it for now. Thanks so much for being here. Don't forget to come back. Join me, Ray, Jonathan, Rob on our next installment of the John Campus Show, which will be tomorrow morning at 1030 a.m. Los Angeles time. We'll definitely be talking about the shakeup going on over at Marvel. A lot of other stories we're already working on for tomorrow as well. I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs>